for thousands of years. <clears throat> for thousands of years, people of faith have been using this sacred season of Lent as a time of asking ourselves hard questions, of preparing ourselves, looking at the way that we live, the way that we breathe, the way that we move and have our being in this world to be the people that God created us to be in anticipation of the day of resurrection of Easter, of being fully prepared to live into this new life that God entrusts us to live. And this year, we are using this sacred season looking at some of the places and ways that Jesus walked, looking at uh, retracing his footsteps from his baptism and his temptation to the heart of his ministry. We're looking at some of the people that he loved, some of the enemies that he made, some of the parables that he taught, and the roads that he traveled. Now, some of you may remember that uh, for the last year or so that we have been preparing, I have been preparing, to lead a group to the Holy Land, and that trip was supposed to be leaving this week. Uh, obviously, uh, with everything that's going on in Israel and in the Middle East right now, that trip is not happening. Uh, so I thought we would all go without actually having to travel. So we are looking at some of the geography and some of the archaeology and some of the, uh, the, the, the retracing the footsteps of Jesus. And this morning, uh, we're going to head for the hills. Uh, and I mean that quite literally. Uh, because after his baptism, after the temptation, Jesus made his way to the region of Galilee, which was a place with quite a few mountains. And those mountains became central to his ministry. Now, now when we pay attention to the archaeology, to the geography of the Bible, it's easy for us to, to recognize that mountains provide a, a pretty important setting for many of the most dramatic and memorable stories, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Think of Abraham and Moses and Elijah. Think of David, who wrote many of the Psalms, <clears throat> wrote many of the Psalms on a mountaintop. Not only that, but if we pay close attention to the Gospels, we see that many of the important episodes in the New Testament took place in the mountains. Now, Jesus loved the water. He spent a lot of time on and near and around the Sea of Galilee, but he also loved the mountains. Think about some of the, the things that took place on the mountains. It was there that he multiplied the loaves and fishes and fed thousands. It was there on the Mount of Transfiguration that the disciples saw Moses and Elijah there with him when they heard the very voice of God. Think of the Mount of Olives where Jesus went to pray on his way into Jerusalem. Think of Mount Zion, Calvary, where he was crucified. And there after the resurrection when he gave the great commission from the top of a mountain before he ascended into heaven. And it was also on those mountains that he gave what uh, I might argue is the most influential sermon in Western civilization, and that is the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, now, there are a number of different mountains in the, around the Sea of Galilee, and we're not exactly sure which one uh, he gave the Sermon on the Mount. We believe it to be Mount Arbel, uh, sometimes referred to as the Mount of the Beatitudes. And from there, you can see all of the cities and all the towns. You can see the entire Sea of Galilee, all of the places and all of the people that he would minister to. And as we'll hear in just a moment, Jesus goes up to the mountain and he begins to teach. Now, that is an important, uh, an important device that Matthew uses because what he's doing, this image that he uses in having Jesus go up to the mountain, is he's intended to remind us of Moses who went up to Mount Sinai to receive the law of God. And, and so Jesus goes up to, to teach. In other words, to, to reinterpret the law, to give this new law for the kingdom of God, what we now refer to as the gospel. So what he's doing is he's setting Jesus up as the new Moses to help us understand what God's will is for us as we seek to follow Jesus, to live into this kingdom of God. And in this sermon, he spells out what it means to be a part of the kingdom, how we should live, what our values should be within the kingdom of God. Now, we don't have time to read through the entire Sermon on the Mount, uh, but I encourage you, uh, challenge you, in fact, to find some time this week to read through the entire Sermon on the Mount. It's only three chapters, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, 6, and 7. 
Uh, and it is powerful, powerful teaching. And a lot of scholars refer to it as the essential Jesus. That if that's all we knew about Jesus, that in many ways that would be enough. He lays out for us the life that we are supposed to live, the ideals to which we are to aspire to live. He seems to be saying this is what you were made to do and to be. So what we're going to hear this morning is the bookends. We're going to hear the first few verses, uh, and then we're going to hear the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. And I invite you to listen now. Today's reading is Matthew 5, verses 1 through 2a, and then 24 through 29. Here begins the reading. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Here ends the reading. The word of God for the people of God. Now you've probably, if you've been here more than two or three times, heard me say that that there are essentially two types of churches in the world today. There are answer churches and there are journey churches. Now I'm not the first one to say that. The first person to articulate that was Scott Colglazier, one of my predecessors, and he was the first one to articulate that, and and in many ways it became very meaningful to a lot of us, myself included. And as a result of that, we are unapologetically a journey church. We don't offer 25-cent answers to $100 questions. We seek to understand the that the Christian faith is, is about a journey more than a destination. It's about, it's about seeking spiritual courage to ask the really hard questions about what it means to be a person of faith, even if there are no easy, simplistic answers. That's what our experience tells us to be true, that we understand life is a journey, and so we come, we come each Sunday not to, to be told what to think, what to believe, to be given simplistic answers, but to find strength and courage. That's who we are as a church. University Christian Church, we know this to be true, and we are proud of that. That being said, do any of you, like me, just wish that sometimes it was a little easier? That Jesus, every once in a while, would be more direct and to say, you know what, here are the magic words to say. Here are the three core principles. Here are the four spiritual laws. Here are the seven happy hops to heaven, whatever whatever it might be. (laughs) Don't we just wish sometimes it were a little easier? Not only that, I would argue that in many ways that it would have been probably less disagreement amongst people of faith, less fighting over what Jesus really meant when he said some of the things that he said. But then again, I might also argue that, that as people of faith, we're pretty good about disagreeing with one another. We're, we're, we're pretty good at that. We'd find other things to disagree about, I'm sure. But isn't it true that in our culture, in our modern era, that we are used to propositional truths, right? We're used to core principles. We we like arguments that are supported by facts. 
We're used to being able to wrap our minds around something. We're, we're, we're encouraged to be skeptical of ideas until we're fully able to understand them. But it's important for us to remember. It's important for us to remember that Jesus wasn't a 21st century motivational speaker. Jesus was a first century Jewish rabbi. And as a result of that, he spoke like that. And so he used stories, what we sometimes refer to as, as parables. He, he talked about a good Samaritan, which was an oxymoron at the time. He talked about a prodigal son. He used analogies and similes. He'd say things like, like the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And he used one of my favorite tools, which is prophetic hyperbole. He would say things like, if your eye causes you to sin, just pluck it out. Now, I'm pretty sure that he was using hyperbole. He wasn't encouraging us to blind ourselves. He was using prophetic hyperbole. And not only that, but when somebody asked him a question, he would almost always, rather than answer it, ask that person a question in response. And while oftentimes we wish that he was more direct, that he was more straightforward, that he gave us easy steps to follow, the truth is he didn't. And probably because the things that he talked about, we couldn't begin to wrap our minds around. And so instead, what he did is he would build bridges using ideas and situations that we can understand. Some of you may remember the story of Nicodemus who was a religious scholar at the time and a Pharisee, and he came to Jesus under the cover of darkness. He was nervous. He was afraid. He was a little bit embarrassed because he had all these questions. He didn't understand what Jesus meant. And finally, Jesus says, if I told you about earthly things and you don't understand, then how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? Central to Jesus' teaching was to help us understand what he meant by the kingdom of God. He was essentially saying that the, that the reign of God was upon us. And not only that, but sounding an awful lot like John the Baptist, he was saying that we should repent, which is a real good churchy word. He was basically saying that God is here, that God is in our midst, so you should think like it. You should act like it. That's ultimately what that churchy word repentance means, to think differently and therefore act differently. And he was calling the people to lay aside the life that they had been living as if, as if it all counted on us, as if the whole world revolved around our belly button, as if we were in charge, that we were called to be followers of Jesus. Jesus. Disciples of Jesus, that we were to serve God and not to serve our own best interests. Now, it's important for us to keep in mind that at that time, the Roman Empire claimed all temporal and eternal authority. By that, I mean Rome ruled, and the emperor was king, not God. And they cracked down on anyone who suggested otherwise, and they tortured, and they crucified enemies of the state, which is eventually what happened to Jesus. But it was into this world that Jesus comes and brings a message to those who felt hopeless and powerless against this unrelenting, this powerful empire that ruled with an iron fist. So I want you to try and imagine for just a moment how it must have been to hear Jesus come in and turn things upside down. And he said, God is king, not Caesar. He said things that, that we are to live with compassion and justice and forgiveness, that we are to love our enemies, to love those who persecute us. That would have sounded so contrary to what the world around them was all about. This message of Jesus was radical. And it invited them to see the world differently. It turned everything upside down. And he would go on, he would go on to say things like, like it's the meek, it's the lowly who are blessed. Not the rich and the powerful and the mighty. 
He would go on to say things like that, that, that in God's kingdom, that, that the wealthy and the powerful are not the ones who get a reward. It's the little, it's the lost, the least, those on the underside of power. He'd say things like in, like in God's kingdom, it's not the celebrities, it's not the popular people who are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. It's the ordinary people. People who sat with him there on that mountain listening to Jesus. It was the poor, it's the sinners, it's the outsiders. They are the salt of the earth. They are the light of the world. You see, the Sermon on the Mount enabled those people to envision a life that was shaped by God's reign, by God's saving presence. In all of their lives and their practices, their identities, they were shaped by the empire that ruled them. But Jesus offered them a new way of living. He offered them new practices, a new identities for a new way of living. He offered them an alternative reality and an alternative community. Now, it's important for us to remember that that was 2,000 years ago. And yet, if we look around at the world today, at the state of the world in which it exists right now, you have to wonder that if in those 2,000 years that people of faith have made even a dent of difference. Because all too often, we still feel powerless and hopeless, as if we're surrounded by evil. But yet it's into this world, into this world that Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand, into this world where 2% of the world's population owns 90% of its wealth, into this world where Congress, those that rule us, that govern us, they can't seem to work together to pass a budget, let alone safe gun measures or immigration reform. It's into this world where just down the street... There are hundreds, if not thousands, of people living on the street, dying on the street. And to this world, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand. You see, I think what he's saying is, what you see around you, the way the world exists today, this is not what God had in mind. This is not what God has in mind. This is not God's will. And he proclaims a different reality. One that is vastly different than what we see around us. But notice that he doesn't say, someday God will reign. He doesn't seem to say, you know, when we all die and get to heaven, then we'll experience the wholeness that God intends for our lives. No, he says, it's here. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's just hidden. You can't see it because you don't know where to look. And so you just have to change your point of view. You have to see the world differently. You have to live differently. You have to love differently. You have to love boldly. Now, let me give you an example of what I mean by this alternate reality. Back in October of 1982, on a beautiful fall afternoon, the University of Wisconsin, the Badgers, were playing Michigan State in football. Before the end of the first half, Michigan State was pummeling the University of Wisconsin. It was a blowout. And Michigan State was running up the score, and Wisconsin was just getting blown out. But what was interesting on that day is that, is that despite the score, despite what was happening in the world around us, there was this energy in the crowd that day. There was, there was shouts of joy and celebration. There was high-fiving going on. There was just this energy and this excitement despite the fact that the Badgers were getting blown out. Now, what you need to know about that story is that on that very day, at that very time, 70 miles away, the Milwaukee Brewers were beating the St. Louis Cardinals in Game 3 of the World Series. And all of those 60,000 people that were there that day watching the football game were listening to their transistor radios. They were watching the game play out in front of them. 
but they were responding to something different than what they saw on the field. They were listening to a different reality. So my question for us this morning is, what if we stopped looking at the world around us to tell us what is real? but instead started listening to what Jesus invites us to do and to be and to experience? What if rather than seeing that the way that the world operates, one that is all too often filled with darkness and despair, what if instead we listen to the voice of Jesus who invites us to follow him on a path of hope and joy, light? What might that look like in your life? Now, I want to close with this because it's interesting to me that when Jesus talks about all of this, this Sermon on the Mount and this new reality, he uses a plural form of the pronoun you, which we all know, right, doesn't exist in the English language except in Texas, right? (laughs) Because we say y'all, and if we really want to get fancy, we say all y'all. So we understand this plural form of the pronoun you. You see, when he talks about the kingdom of God, when he talks and shows us how we are to live, he isn't just talking to us individually. He's talking to all y'all. He's talking to us as a community of faith. He's talking to the church. Now let me tell you this story. Not too long ago I met someone and I struck up a conversation and she asked me what I did for a living and against my better judgment I told her. (laughs) And finally she says, what church do you serve? And I said, I serve University Christian Church. And she goes, oh, I know UCC. And I said, what do you know about UCC? And she says, you all have a beautiful church. And we do. I didn't argue with her. We do. And not only that, but we are going through right now construction in which we are giving a lot of time and energy and a lot of resources to make our building even better to make it more inviting, to make it more welcoming, to make it more reflective of the welcoming spirit of our congregation. But I got to tell you, I got to tell you that I was haunted by that conversation. Because that's what, not what I want us to be known for. I don't want us to be known for having a beautiful building. And so I started thinking, what would it be like if we were not known for the beauty of our building, but by the depth of our concern? If we were not known for the beautiful building, but that we are a, com- that we are a community of faith that is passionate about living out the ideals that Jesus presents in the Sermon on the Mount, that we are passionate about following Jesus, about working as hard as we can to proclaim that there is a different way to see the world, there is a different way to live in this world than what we see around us. What would that be like? What would we be like? In other words, what would it look like if we were to understand that we don't just come to church on Sunday morning. That we don't come to church at all, but that we are the church. That we are the church. That we are a body of people that are journeyed together, who have a, 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 a mission and a ministry that gathers together to worship and to encourage one another. That we come together to find strength for the journey, the courage to live out this kingdom of God that is already at hand, despite what the world around us sees. What would it be like? What would it be like? But most importantly, most importantly, how might the world around us be different if we were passionate, if we were passionate about living out Christ's courageous love? What might that look like? What might we look like 
And what might the world around us look like if that were true?